Greetings and welcome to the 2022 Ohioana Book Festival. I'm David Siders, a longtime Ohioana Library Association Board of Trustees member, and pleased to welcome you to our panel, The Wonders of the Natural World, Plants, Animals, and the Beauty of Nature, which are on display in these wonderful books by the talented authors you see here today. Uh, we'd like to thank our festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed on the Ohioana website. And thanks to our official bookseller, The Book Loft of German Village. You can get copies of all of the books featured at the festival by going online to bookloft.com. And now I'm so pleased to welcome our authors. We'll start with Raffaele Di Lalo um, and his book, Houseplant Warrior. Raffaella has been growing houseplants for over 30 years, and it all started in grade school as a way to clean the air from his father's smoking habit. It quickly became an obsession, and he in, uh, continues to grow a, a vast array of plants, both indoors and out. So essentially in 2017, Raffaella started a blog post, which quickly became very popular and led to his Ohio Tropics houseplant uh, care website which made it to the top 10 houseplant care blogs on the internet, according to Feedspot. So long story short, the popularity of this website got him thinking about the idea of a book and led to the Houseplant Warrior. Uh, Raffaele received his uh, BS in chemical engineering from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois in 2000. Uh, he received his certificate of home horticulture from Oregon State University as a part of their master gardening program. Uh, he completed the Green Gardener program at the Cleveland Botanical Garden and is a member of the American Orchid Society as well as Garden Communicators International and worked part-time as a freelance writer for the popular gardening know-how website. He, is, he also self-published a succinct but very popular guide to orchid care, Moth Orchid Mastery. Welcome to John D. Harder, who is Associate Professor Emeritus in Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology at The Ohio State University, where he taught upper division courses in mammalogy and conservation biology. His research on the reproductive biology and ecology of mammals has focused on marsupials and involved field studies in Ohio, Venezuela, and Amazonian Peru. Next, welcome Mary Newman, PhD, who is the co-author of Cherry, Edible Flowers, A Global History, and Coconut, A Global History, which is forthcoming later this year in 2022, co-written with her sister, Constance Perker. Mary has taught at Ohio University, the University of Malta, and Silpacorn University in Thailand, the latter two as a Fulbright specialist. Welcome, Mary. And we have Amy Nazuku Ma Patil, who is the author of the New York Times bestselling illustrated collection of nature essays and Kirkus Prize finalist, World of Wonders, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishment. Published in 2020, which was chosen as Barnes and Noble's Book of the Year. Amy has four previous poetry collections, Oceanic, Lucky Fish, at the Drive-In Volcano, and Miracle Fruit. Her most recent chapbook is Lace and Pyrite, a collaboration of epistolary garden poems with the poet Ross Gay. Her writing appears twice in the Best American Poetry Series, the New York Times Magazine, ESPN, Plowshares, American Poetry Review, and Ten House. Welcome to all of our esteemed authors, and let's get into exploring your wonderful books and the wonders of the natural world. So naturally, our first question is, how did you come up with the idea and focus of your book? Um, and we'll start with Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, I wanted to say, um, I did not know I was actually writing a book. I thought these were kind of um, you know, almost like little bedtime stories in some ways for my children who at the time were six and nine. And I can remember this very clearly because it was written, um, uh, the beginnings of it were written my first year here in Mississippi. I'm, I'm live in Oxford, Mississippi now. 
Um, but I spent my high school and college and graduate years in Ohio. I just found I, I could not write about my favorite, um, I guess I should say this, this is a collection of um, 30 plants and animals, not that I'm an expert in them, because I'm a poet, I'm not a science a scientist, but 30 pl um, plants and animals that I have questions about and that I still am just in, so full of awe uh, over. So I found I could not write about the narwhal, for example, or the monarch butterfly without remembering something from my childhood. Um, and especially because the audience was my children, <laughs> I thought, you know, I, I, they wanted to know about my childhood. So um, it just came, you know, it, it was like very soothing for me in 2016 was a time of lots of political strife going on. And they had a lot of questions like, mommy, what, what does build that wall mean? You know, things like that. And um, I don't know if I gave great answers, but I knew that the last thing I wanted them to think about was kind of the magic and the wonder of the plant world and the animal world. And I also did not want to shy away from answering these kind of difficult questions. What does it mean to be the only brown girl in a room? You know, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, so it was kind of an accidental um, collection of, uh, of essays. For sharing those hot heartfelt thoughts. And Raffaele, how about you? How did you come up with the idea and focus of your book? Sure. So I've been I've been very active on on social media um, as well as on my blog. I started my blog about five years ago, OhioTropics.com, and so I I literally daily I get questions and comments from from my readers and my followers, and I've seen a lot of the same struggles that people are are going through in trying to trying to raise plants. And it, it's just reoccurring, the same constant themes kept cropping up. And there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there about plant care. And after seeing all this confusion, I, I really wanted to simplify it. And I, I found that a lot, of, a lot of the information that's out there, you know, whether it's in, in you know, people's blogs or, or in books, a lot of it is either way too vague to be helpful or way too scientifically explicit for, for most people to understand. And so I, I really wanted to, to make it accessible in plain language so that anybody can understand the solid basics of houseplant care. Uh, so, so as a result of all, all the common themes that I kept seeing, I, I wanted to provide a book that anybody can pick up and read and instill the confidence in, in them to say, yes, I, that I'm, I'm inspired. I can now take care of these plants um, because there's, there's so much confusion. There's so much conflicting advice. Um, so I wanted to make it simple for my, for my readers. It's really great to hear because there's clearly such a need. There's an explosion of popularity of, of house plants. I live at a market here in Cincinnati and almost every shop seems to be offering plants now. So <laughs> I think you're, you're in demand now. So that's, your focus is, is fantastic. And John, how about you and your uh, focus on mammals of Ohio? Well, the, my, my reason for writing the book is perhaps a little more mundane than the first two uh, participants have shared. Um, almost every state in the union has a mammals of, okay? And uh, it's part guidebook and part scientific uh, reference and the balance of that changes from one to another. Some mammals of Ohio are very close to what you might think of as a Peterson field guide and others are read uh, only by uh, park naturalists and that sort of thing. But the need um, is there and I was encouraged after doing a statewide survey of small mammals, which I'll share later is, is really the crux of mammal mammalian life in most states are small cryptic animals uh, that have to be studied by special means. Uh, so having completed that, I lamented the fact that we don't know that much about Ohio mammals. And uh, my co-author and I set out to collect um, the very best photos, the very best line drawings, and search the primary literature uh, for the most recent information on these species. Um, as you might guess, um, 
we know a whole lot about white-tailed deer, and we know a whole lot about uh, some of the more charismatic species like river otters and the like. Um, bats are another group that we are studying quite well because they are uh, endangered, almost all of them uh, threatened or, or in, in some way in, in a conservation um, status that's, that's not good, primarily because of white nose syndrome, which you may have heard of. It's a fungal disease that attacks bats when they're hang hanging out in, in caves and mines. So uh, mammals are popular. Uh, most people, when they say love animals, what they're really saying is they love their cats and dogs and the squirrels around their house. But our goal is to try to introduce um, the mammals of Ohio, all 55 of the extant reproducing species that we have here in Ohio, to both the, um, the, uh, the educated generalist, somebody who gets tired of nature shows, wants a little bit more, uh, the naturalist, and our colleagues. And so as writing, uh, we were keenly aware of people on our shoulder, looking over our shoulder of our colleagues, but as also trying to make this, as Raphael said, accessible. Uh, and, and that's hard for two retired professors who have spent their whole life uh, publishing primary literature <laughs> on research. Uh, we're both research professors and um, a first time for this effort. I, I looked at my author's CV, my co-author, uh, Guy Cameron. Uh, as I said, he's head of biological sciences. And I thought, oh, this would be great. I can kind of piggyback on him. He's probably written a couple of textbooks. And, <laughs> and uh, no, I didn't see a book in his, his resume and he didn't see one of mine. We did book chapters and you know, research publication, you know, primary articles. And we thought, well, how hard could this be? We've been going to school for the last two or three years learning how hard that is. Uh, so, but anyway, we're quite pleased with the product and um, hope it will be useful to people interested in mammals. Thank you, John. So much to learn and so enlightening so far. And I'm excited because we'll have some questions later on in our event today to dive deeper into the mammals of Ohio. So I can't wait to learn more. And Mary, your book, Cherry, how did you and your sister come up with the idea and focus of your beautiful book? Uh, a very, very, very short answer. And that is uh, the publisher asked us to write it. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that everybody hopes, uh, you know, but that was based on our previous book, which is called Edible Flowers, A Global History. And we had done the same book, uh, the Edible Flowers with the publisher and they liked it. Um, and I think, any writer that turns in something on time, coherent, <laughs> uh, just basically does what they're supposed to do, made it interesting. Um, so they wanted us to do another one. Edible Flowers though, is probably a more interesting story. Um, it's part of a series that they have and they're single ingredient um, books. And they've got over, over 90 now books out on this. So there's a book on corn, there's a book on garlic, a book on pumpkin, it goes on and on and on. And we wanted to write, and we wanted to write something for this company. And we're trying to think what's left. You know, at that time, there was about 60 that had already been printed, and we came up with the idea of edible flowers. And what we wanted was something that was going to interest us and that we could do a lot of research together and enjoy doing. So basically it's um, trying to find something. And I don't think there's hardly anything else left. Our next one was coconut. We found one more thing and now we're writing one on mango. So I don't know what's left. They must be up to about a hundred by now. So <laughs> anyway, so that's sort of it. So wonderful to hear the demand and the need and the timeliness of all of your books and their focus. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so is it different to write a nonfiction book about always changing topics in science, nature, sociology, et cetera, than it is to say something like historical events that may not change? Um, we'll start with you, Raffaele. Sure. So fortunately, the, the basics of houseplant care doesn't really change, um, although I'll have to say, you know, some things will evolve. 
And uh, there, there's two things that I can think of offhand that, you know, that they'll constantly be, be new developments. Um, in terms of potting mix right now, I know there's a lot of focus on uh, sustainability and um, you know sustainability of peat moss. A lot of a lot of the potting mixes are traditionally peat based, and so you know, that that's come under scrutiny more and more recently um, with, with sustainability. Uh, so people are finding alternate alternate materials for potting mixes, which is which is great too. So I've I've explored a little bit fairly recently. Uh, on that topic as well. And another one that I can think of is uh, grow lights. So, you know, there's more and more LED grow lights that are, that are, that are coming out in the market, which is helpful. Um, but fortunately, you know, the basics of plant care is, is the same, although we might see, you know, some new products here and there, some of them are, you know, a little bit gimmicky, but, but the basics are, are never going to change. Um, you know, nature, <laughs> <laughs> it's just nature, right? Um, so, so fortunately, uh, it, it doesn't really affect my my field as much, I, I should say. So fascinating to think how people are thinking more and more about sustainability and products that are gently gentler to the earth, and you're right there to respond to that. Great. Amy, you've touched on reasons that you wrote your book, but maybe talk a little bit more about the sort of the transformation of poetry and your expertise in poetry into writing a nonfiction book. Yeah, you know, I, um, my uh, MFA from Ohio State was actually in poetry and nonfiction. I just had earlier success with poetry. Um, but what I would say is when I'm choosing to, to decide between poetry or nonfiction, I just wanted my, I wanted to pay attention to the sentence rather than the line. And what I mean by that is I wanted, um, I had a lot of questions and I had a lot of um, things to say that I did not want to have that kind of tension with a line break. So I wanted my sentences to unfurl like a fern. I really wanted them to kind of, you know, be almost like a paragraph long sentences in some case. Uh, and then I also wanted to go back to the brevity, but one thing that my um, that my poetry training has given me is that um, the attention to the image, um, trusting in metaphor, that even if you're describing something that most people haven't seen before, like a cassowary, um, and I haven't seen a cassowary bird, um, they live in New Zealand, and I have only seen them through the magic of YouTube and stuff like that. Um, I rely on metaphor, you know, and I rely on other, you know, reports and I, I can tell which reports are, um, which scientists have uh, attention to detail in, in creating this, making this bird come to life, and which are just, just all concerned about measurements and, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it was really a fun challenge to be able to use my, um, what I've learned in poetry, to be able to apply that to how do I create um, a vivid narrative over things like um, maybe a cockatiel that people have seen in a pet store, as well as a narwhal, you know, that kind of thing, and make both seem that you can see them right before your eyes, you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's from the magic of poetry. I'm glad for that. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Now, John, you've had a distinguished career in academics all over the world, and you've touched on this a little bit, but shifting your focus from a more academic research model in your, in your career to a book that is more accessible, how, how was that process for you to kind of make your writing more accessible uh, to your readers? Painful. <laughs> um. Listening to Amy, I think maybe Guy and I would have appreciated her input as to making the image come alive rather than uh, focusing and being obsessed with the correct measurements. But this this book had a lot of, of goals and uh, the process of taking two retired research professors who have spent their life criticizing the writing of others um, at, a, at a primary technical research level, and then getting to the point where we can um, be honest and 
polite and gentlemanly, uh, correcting each other's uh, syntax, and and uh, so it was it was a throwback to the days of uh, uh, <laughs> early graduate studies, learning learning how to write, not only to write. So we had a book that read like one piece, not separate little chapters, because we took the fifty five species of mammals. Uh, and divided them up more or less, and then then proofread and went through. Most chapters had about six revisions before we even submitted them, uh, and uh, they they're coming out about five pages per uh, species, each of fifty five. So it was it was a real task, and mindful that we couldn't make it too long. Um, that process. Uh, we achieved, and then we, the, the fun part was finding good photographs. Uh, there are some line drawings in our book that, that we can borrow from other uh, sources that were really outstanding. Um, the, the process of taking research that is coming out in research journals and then digesting it and trying to put it forth in a way that um, is more like fun facts than, than uh, the, the stuff of, of, of primary research articles is. is um, we were on it. Um, we came to thinking that we should do this back in, about, I think it was about uh, 2012, and maybe got serious about it in 2016, and uh, more or less 12 months of the year in 2018 is putting it together. Uh, so it, it took us a long time. And we're mindful of the fact that it is a, a primary reference. I mean, people check it, there are tables, there are measurements, there are endless details. Uh, when we get to the part describing behavior of a star nosed mole, wow, <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, because I mean, uh, I told people, I wish I knew everything I know now when I was teaching mammalogy, because uh, there's so much I didn't know about the species right under our nose, because I didn't read all the, all the literature on it. So it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic term paper is about what it amounts to. And, and if you've written that as a student, you have some appreciation for what we've done. Well, hats off to your tenacity and perseverance and uh, all those revisions and coming up with a wonderful end product of Mammals of Ohio. That's what academics do. They just keep plowing away. <laughs> and likewise, Mary, you've had a distinguished career in academics all over the world. So maybe touch on your teaching internationally on what subjects you did and how did that lead to your beautiful books on edible flowers, cherries, and coconuts? Okay, it's it's a little strange. Um, I'm retired, so I'm not teaching anything right now. Uh, my degree is in public health and environmental health. And what I did was co-author these books with my sister, and she's an art history professor, or she also is retired. So we work together. And I did the, the more science kind of things, like the botany part, or the new species that are coming up, or... I love to play with recipes. I feel like I'm back in the lab. I used to work in a lab and I can add some of this and add some of that and see how the flavors work out and stuff. So I feel like I'm doing research and stuff. But my main goal and both of our goals were to make it accessible. And so we do not have a lot of jargon. We don't have, I don't think anyway, I think it's very readable and, and interesting. Um, the science is not very deep um, at all. I don't think that, um, anybody would have trouble with what science that we do have in there. And um, it was just fun working with my sister. She does, she did more of the cultural part, the art part, the photography part. Um, I did a lot of the editing and the, the detail work because I'm really more of an academic in that way and the recipes, but that's kind of how we put it all together. And these the books are global history. So the international travel was really important. Um, coconut, of course, in Thailand. And, you know, so we did a lot of travel together. We can talk about that later too, but that was an important aspect. My sister lives in Philadelphia, so we weren't together. So we traveled together to do the different things. So I think that answered your question, right? Yes, thanks for sharing that fascinating collaboration. Yes. 
Now for Rafaela, your book is uh, based on, as we mentioned, your blog and development of a, a, web, a web presence. How did you adapt those uh, efforts or your work online to a book format? In other words, librarians love to know how you decided on sort of chapters or indexing. How did you compile a book? Sure. So it was it was a little bit of a process and my publisher actually helped me organize in the beginning, you know, the, the a high level structure of, of the book. So of course I wanted to include, you know, what every, any plant care book has, you know, focusing on, on light, watering, potting mixes, all that type of stuff. Um, and also feature, you know, some, some popular plants, uh, plant profiles. So the second half of my book has all the plant profiles. Um, but what I also, what I wanted to do was tell a story through, through the book as well. So it's actually organized in, in four different sections. One is focusing on what, what is the environment like in your house or in your home? Because your environment, you can't force a plant to grow anywhere you want it to, right? You can't make nature do something, but you can put a plant in an environment that it likes you can't just put it wherever you want it to go. Um, so I focus on, you know, what plant is right for you. Um, so all of our, you know, light, our humidity um, conditions are all different. And it also has to fit your lifestyle too. So I focus, I focus on that in the first section of the book. And then the second section I talk about, you know, routine care. Um, so watering and fertilizing, pots, potting mixes, things of that nature. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I also focus on the third section is on troubleshooting. And that's really the, the core of, of what I try to do in the book, because um, what, what a lot of people do is, you know, what, whenever we have a plant problem, we most of us go to Google. And so we have to be careful with that, because a lot of times, a lot of sites oversimplify the issue and people take them people take that as, as the absolute truth, but, but what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of different things can cause yellow leaves. It's not just overwatering. That, that, that's the big thing. And in, in fact, it's one of my pet peeves. And I, I have a whole section in my book on over overwatering because I have a lot of strong feelings about that. So a lot of different things can cause many different plant woes. And a lot of, a lot of them are complete opposites. So what's missing is observation because too many people don't observe their plants. You can't just blindly trust what you, what you read in Google, um, you know, on a site that comes up from a Google search. You actually have to physically observe your own plants and then become your own plant doctor, if you will. So that's what I try to teach people in, in my book. Really great perspectives, thanks for sharing. Now, John, I know the poet Anne Sexton was obsessed with the Starnos mole. So when you mentioned that, I never thought the Starnos mole was in Ohio. But my question is for all of, for you is what is an animal that lives in Ohio that most people would be surprised to hear about? Surprised to hear that they were present in Ohio? Um, well, I, I suspect the great majority, that this is really the problem in people's perception of mammals. We have 55 species of mammals in Ohio and that give or take uh, one or two, depending if they're reproducing and nearly extinct and so forth, about 55 species. And only about six of these can be seen during the day. Most mammals are small, 30 grams, if you're into metrics. I don't know what that is in ounces and I, refuse to know, but uh, 30 grams or less than 100 grams, uh, you know, the chipmunk and even your short-tailed shrew that you see burrowing around your beds and your gardens, that's, that's a monster shrew. Uh, so chipmunks and sm almost everything is smaller than a chipmunk. Uh, so how do you study them? squirrels and deer and bear and so forth you can see, but how do you study those? So most people are completely unaware of the diversity of mammals as you relate to um, rodents, for example. Uh, we have you know, 20 some species of rodents and, and most of them are little brown 
cigar shaped things that you don't see unless you trap them. So I always tell people that I have a great deal of envy for ornithologists who can go out and listen to the birds singing on a spring day and trespass with their binoculars into whatever they can reach, uh, you know. And for mammalogists, you have to go up to the landowner or the uh, public land manager and say, how about if I come in and trap some things on your property so I know what is there? So um, those uh, sorts of things, I suppose one species that I could say that people would be very surprised is a three gram uh, pygmy shrew uh, that is, is found in Ohio and, and it represents one of the smallest mammals uh, in Ohio. Uh, I don't think too many people are aware of the star-nosed mole uh, and all the way it feeds uh, the biology of and the behavior of mammals uh, is diverse, highly diverse. And that's a theme, even though we don't see most of the mammals. Uh, in Ohio, we have species that burrow, spend their whole life underground. And we have species that are bowling and feed at night with echolocation. Uh, the three species of moles that we have, the star-nosed mole, the, uh, short, uh, the, the short tailed mole and the common mole are all feeding with different sensory perception underground. Um, the common mole that tears up our lawns uh, actually uh, listens for, uh, uh, and follows the, not listens, but follows the scent trail of worms to the point that the worms have evolved sensory perception to the digging of moles and they exit the ground when, there's, when there is a mole working in their tunnels and working the ground. And so, uh, as opposed to the, the star-nosed mole that actually is aquatic and has those, those, those tentacles are actually sensory and manipulative. Uh, and so that's the, the depth, and that's what we are excited about in telling about the behavior of these animals and, and, and the diversity of the structure. Uh, I don't know if that answers your, your, your questions, but um, there, there are species that are rare. I suppose most people realize that there are black bears in Ohio. They're still considered endangered because according to conservation principles, you don't have a resident species and until they are reproducing and, and have, have youngsters running around. So we have a lot of young males coming over from Pennsylvania and <laughs> West Virginia, but we don't consider them, they're in, they're in danger because we're really not sure that they're, they're reproducing in Ohio. Fascinating, the nocturnal and underground nature is so mysterious and wants me to learn, right. encourages me to learn more yeah. about what's going on in Ohio. And that's, uh, your mention of endangered species is a nice segue. Uh, for Amy, you've touched on what has drawn you into writing about plants and animals, but tell us a little bit more about your focus on endangered or threatened animals, and also how you felt when your experience with writing poetry morphing into a nonfiction book was actually finished and ready. <clears throat> so, the mic. Sorry, David, can you repeat the first part of the question? I have an answer to the second, but it's the first one that I wanted to, to hear. You've told us a, about what drew you into writing about plants and animals, but uh, I understand you have a focus more on endangered or threatened animals. Mm. Um, what uh, encouraged you to focus on that? And how did you finally feel that your nonfiction book was a complete product? Yeah, you know, um, I there are many environmental books out there that um, are uh, either designed or unintentionally um, uh, causing anger and fear and a little bit of finger pointing and in, in rightly so, you know, there's a lot to be upset about. There's a lot to be scared of and there's a lot to be worried over for climate change. Those are super important books. I'm so glad we have them. I read, I read many of them. I teach environmental literature. I teach them. Um, that's not what I wanted to do with this book, though. Um, for me, I just I, when I was kind of taking stock, once I started putting together these essays, 
Um, I was thinking just personally in my own life, and this is not prescriptive. This is not how everybody should be. I, I welcome like so many different voices to the table of environmental nature writing. Um, but for me, I know that when I get motivated to be an activist or to actually get off, off my butt and write to my congressman or to march, um, you know, it's because I do it not because I'm so full of anger. For me, I do it out of love. Like, oh my gosh, I love these yellow warblers. His voice sound, you know, that the mnemonic of their, their call is sweet, sweet. I'm so sweet, sweet, sweet. I'm so sweet. How can you not fall in love with a yellow warbler? You know, that kind of thing. Um, that's when I, it's like almost this mama bear protective. I want to protect it and keep it. So there are definitely other books that do a better job of scaring you, pointing your finger, like you need to change your life. Again, those are all great and necessary, but for me, because I know how I react um, when, when people point fingers at me or stuff like that, I react more like wanting to change my life and do something like to help other people when it's out of something that I love. So I just, I really wanted to kind of put the focus in to start. I wanted to start with love and I wanted to end with love to say, look at how much there is on the planet. I know there's so much terrible, I know it. I did not know there was gonna be a pandemic, you know, when my book was released, but um, instead of focusing, or at least just in addition to focusing, I didn't wanna get people to not think about kind of the scary and sad stuff going on. But in addition to, let's not lose sight of all the things that are out there. And there's still, you know, this was a list of 200 plants and animals, and I whittled it down for this book to 30. So I could have done, you know, four more volumes of this and still been, and, and that would have just been scraping the start surface. So I think if people find, like I asked my, my college students, do you have a favorite cephalopod, a favorite kind of, you know, um, and if not, do you have a favorite whale? If not, you need to fix your life, you know, like how can you, how can you be a human and not have a favorite octopus, you know, or a favorite kind of squid underwater, you know, that kind of thing. So I say that not to shame people, but just to encourage like, hey, it's kind of nice to remember what we love instead of, oh, I hate this. I'm scared of this. I'm scared of this. That's what all the powers that be want us to do. Um, and it's easy to do. <laughs> it's easy to kind of go down this shame spiral and sadness spiral where I just want to put a weighted blanket over my head and say, I'm not coming out, you know, like this darn nose mole, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think there's so much on this planet to love and be awe, in awe of. And I think if we remember that, um, we see how much we have in common with other people who might be different than us because we, we can all share like a, the same love of, of a yellow warbler, you know, that kind of thing. I think there's a lot more of a, a lot more things that we have in common than we have uh, to be afraid of. And that's not what the powers that be would like us to remember. So, um, I'm just saying without pointing fingers, let's remember what we love. Let's remember what it is to be human. Thanks for sharing such a refreshing and energizing perspective. Thank That's you. wonderful to hear, yeah. And Mary, what is something you didn't know about cherries that surprised you during your writing process? Well, I love cherries. <laughs> Um, so back on to love. Anyway, probably the biggest thing is, um, have you ever heard of the spice Malab? M-A-H-L-A-B. There's lots of other pronunciations of it, but the pit that's inside of a cherry, you break it open, there's a little kernel. That kernel can be dried and shredded, and that's a spice used in Middle Eastern cooking. Mm. And I didn't know that. You can buy it and, and put it in different things. Um, in in France, they have a cherry pie, a clafouti, that has the whole cherries in it with the pits. And that's because that little spice comes out in it. Um, and sometimes when people are making jam in the United States, they'll take all the pits that they've pitted all the, the jam and they put it in a gauze bag and put that as they're cooking down the jam and that adds it. It's kind of almost an almond extract kind of thing. So it's just kind of fun. I didn't even know that existed. Um, the book is really about the whole cherry tree, the, the blossoms and the, the, the stems. I mean, you can, the, the stem to a cherry, you can make tea out of. And then there's this 
bar trick where you can put the stem in your mouth and you can tie it and uh, you're considered quite dexterous with your tongue if you can tie the cherry stem inside um, inside your mouth without taking it out. So there's a lot of fun things. We really tried to make the book fun, things you'd never heard of. You can eat cherry blossoms and I make a, a deviled eggs where I put the cherry blossom on top and it's just really pretty, you know. So there's a lot of good times. <laughs> So I think it's a happy book. I, I just think it, cherries are happy. Life is a bowl of cherries. Even the pits are fun. That's not great answers. Great answers. And to kind of connect with some of the things Amy said, um, what motivates humans to love animals and nature so much while human can't, kind can have such a tendency to harm um, nature all the time? And Mary, let's go back to you with your international perspective as well. Well, cherry trees have been used for diplomacy for a long time. I mean, we all probably are aware of the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, tidal basin cherry blossoms. They were planted by a, a delegation from Japan that came over here. Um, at Athens, Ohio, for Ohio University, um, they have a path, a bike path, and they had a delegation from Japan come and plant cherry trees along the bike path. And that's an important part of diplomacy is you're giving somebody something and they you enjoy that. It rem you remind them of that. Uh, when we were doing this book, my sister and I traveled to Romania and my church has a partner church in Romania and we planted a cherry tree there and it's still growing. We just got a, a text message this week that it's starting to blossom. Um, so it's just kind of a diplomacy thing. It's an international um, kind of fun thing. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> and John, with your international experience, what do you think about the balance and well, the increasing popularity and deepening awareness of sustainability, earth friendliness, and so on, and encouraging people to learn more about mammals as your book does, but kind of the balance of, you know, some kinds of farming techniques and other things are not so good for the earth. What are your perspectives on that balance? Well, um, I guess I would prefer to sort of, I could say a lot about rainforest destruction, uh, bleaching of corals, and um, but one of the things about mammals, generally terrestrial mammals, is they're, as in all species, very sensitive to their habitat. And when you think about Ohio, uh, roughly 95% of Ohio was covered by forest uh, just at the turn of the last century, not well, the previous century, the 1800, right? 95%, uh, a squirrel would never have to touch the ground going from Lake Erie to <laughs> the Ohio River, that sort of thing. And so by the turn of the 1900, uh, there was only about 12% of Ohio was forested, as you might. And that, that's a remarkable feat. If you read about the size of the white oaks, you know, breast height diameter of, you know, two or three meters and just enormous and all done by saw and ax and horsepower. These farmers were serious and they wanted to clear the land and get on and most of it had to be drained. So it's one of the favorite chapters in the book for me, <laughs> as you might tell. I'm getting away from the details of, of, of you know, a white-tailed um, uh, mouse and so forth. So getting on with that theme, I have a little chart that I'd like to just maybe hold up for you um, in this chapter on natural history. And, and when you... Uh, it's not going to work very well, but that tallest bar is that 95%, and over the course of just 50 years, dropping down, and by 100 years, down to 12%, and now has recovered, okay, so that recovery of forest has an impact, and the process of that recovery uh, changes the habitat for small mammals, and so there's a constant uh, shift not all of it bad. Uh, as the uh, land opened up, you have species that are adapted to grasslands and, sh and feeding on shrubs. 
do better than in a, in a deep forest. Our deer population uh, was decimated around the turn of about 1900, uh, but with regulation of hunting, all that land that was now shrub and grass was wonderful and the predators were gone and we had an explosion of deer, uh, is, which is one of the kind of poster child of, of, of this relationship between forest and open land. And uh, at the other hand, uh, species that rely on forest, and squirrels and so forth, uh, don't do so well when, when they're, they're thinned out. But Ohio was going through constant change all the time. And if you were to try to understand that, you have to understand the abundance and distribution of a whole variety of species. Uh, and uh, most people probably wouldn't realize that we have more forest now uh, than we did 60 years ago uh, or 100 years ago. And that's, that's kind of the point of that one graph. Um, people love mammals. They love open spaces, flowers and birds. Um, but don't move to the point where the congressmen feel it. And uh, there are organizations, lots of organizations that are conservation oriented, but it's a tough way to go to, to work against uh, moneyed interests uh, who, who benefit from externalizing their, their waste uh, and not you know, comp compensating for that in the price. So I've been in conservation all my life and uh, it's, it's disheartening. Um, we all know the Dust Bowl story, how the Southern Plains blew away. The Ogallala Offer is now being pumped dry for corn to be put into gasoline. I mean, so you, I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, Amy's uh, <laughs> brighter side because it, uh, you do have to have a, a a certain amount of optimism. Um, nature is resilient, and that's that's the good thing. Nature is resilient uh, to a point, and we hope that people read and think, uh, and and hopefully our books will will help them make a make a point and uh, with their elected officials, and not just accept as inevitable the destruction of our planet. John for sharing those important perspectives. And Rafaela, you've touched on um, folks' interest in the growing movement of sustainable uh, planting mediums. Um, what other thoughts do you have about this sort of balance or need to embrace a more earth-friendly um, environment versus some of the toxicity of humankind toward nature? Sure, and I, I think in, in my particular case, you know, as just hearing everybody speak, I think when you're actually involved with something, that's that's when you really start to care about it more. If you if you look at it from a distance, you know, it's you're you're not quite really connected to it. But if you start growing growing plants, you know, in in in, in my case, you have more of a you have more of a connection uh, automatically. You start you're nurturing the plant. Right. I mean, we're acting as as mother nature because, you know, the plants won't take care of themselves when 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 they're indoors. Um, so we we have to act as as mother nature, if, if you will, indoors. Um, and we also have to have, you know, our we, we do have a responsibility too, on, um, you know, sustainability and you know, we, we have to realize that every single product, and, and this is something that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm evolving too. You know, I, like I mentioned before, um, most, most potting mixes are traditionally peat-based. I'm experimenting with a lot of, um, in fact, I have a collaboration right now where I'm experimenting with, with more environmentally sustainable potting mixes, um, you know, that, that are better for, for our planet. And so as long as, you know, we, we, we have to keep in mind our, our impact and, and the products that we purchase, you know, what impact does that really have um, to our environment? You know, env our, our products and our plants, our potting mixes, whatever we happen to purchase, I think it's our, our responsibility to, um, to, to really realize you know, what impact does it have? 
And unfortunately, you know, money talks, <laughs> right? And so if, if all of us participate in that and choose sustainable products, then everything will shift towards that. It, it's kind of like organic produce, right? More and more people are interested in, in purchasing and, and eating organic produce and the markets will up clearly have to go in that direction in order for, for farmers and, and the producers of, of that food, um, you know, for that industry to, to keep going. And so if we all do our part, then, then it really will, will make an impact. And thanks so much for that important perspective. And I think we're sort of moving toward the end of our journey together here in this event, but I have one kind of final thought and a couple of questions to ask all of you. And I'll start with Amy. Um, we here at the Ohio Anna Book Festival have come to know that people, our guests love to hear about the writing process, how you generate ideas and come up with next project. So very interested in hearing from all of you, but we'll start with Amy about just kind of touch on your writing process, how you generate ideas and what books or projects you foresee next. Thank you. Well, you know, one thing I'm very fond of saying, um, because I feel like sometimes we need to hear it a little bit um, since 2020, is that uh, it's been very hard for me to write. You know, it's it's um, more than hard. It's the most difficult time I've ever had um, writing in, uh, you know, my first book came out in 2002, 2003. And um, I always patted myself on the back as being able to write through anything, but you know we are also in a global pandemic, which has never happened in in my lifetime, you know, before. And um, I would say I'm talking to myself as much as anybody else out there um, watching that to be kind of gentle with yourself um, because there's the root of the word poet means to make, and I believe there's other things. I've turned actually to um, taking better care of my house plants, thanks to sites like Raphael's. I actually follow him. I mentioned, you know, a private message to him. I follow him on Instagram long before I even knew he had that we would be doing this, um, this panel together um, because it's, it, there's just something so grounding. And I feel like when I'm tending my plants, I also come up with ideas to write, you know, but when I'm staring at a blank piece of paper, and the weight of the pandemic is on me and thinking about my loved ones and I haven't seen them, it's really hard for me to, to write the kinds of things I want to. But again, because I love tending plants in my home and I've, it's become a different relationship now during the pandemic, um, I'm able to kind of channel some of that tenderness and vulnerability into my writing. So what I've been writing about is um, food. I'm, I'm laughing only because my, my friends know my joke is that I'm, um, I'm eating my feelings through the pandemic, you know? Um, but I was like, well, my, why not kill two birds, you know, here? And, and actually I say that as a joke, but, um, but um, I have a new book coming out. I don't know exactly when, but um, I'm in the process of writing it where it's, uh, I'm taking a close look at, um, the origins, kind of a natural history, uh, just in short, short versions though, natural history of different um, ingredients. So the natural history of butter, um, mint, um, growing mint and how that could be a disaster if you decide to plant it um, in the ground, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, figs and how wasps go inside um, a fig flower to, to fertilize them, things like that. So kind of a little bit, I'm still in awe of the planet, but I'm really ch channeling it now into food. Fascinating, thanks for sharing that vision. Yes. Right. And Mary, we know Coconuts to be released <laughs> later this year and you've yes. talked about the series in collaborations with your sister. Yeah. What's ahead for you? I, I think Amy better buy every one in these series. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote to myself, I wrote a note down. I was like, I'm looking at all of your books. I, that's going to be my next bookstore order is um, it's, it's right up my alley, Mary. So it's, it's all about the cultural history. That, that was the, the important part. <laughs> um, we really like the travel aspect of it. So for Cherry, we went to Portugal, we went to Ukraine, we went to France, Italy. Um, we even went to Belarus <laughs> and Romania. Um, it was just kind of fun. We really connected with people. We went to Belarus, which is hardly anybody goes to. Um, and the lady there says, you're the first Americans we've had in like 10 years here. Why are you here? <laughs> I said, to, to study cherries and what you do with cherries. And 
by the next morning, this receptionist there, it was a hotel, and um, she had dug up a bunch of stuff uh, and Xeroxed it for me and told me where I can go get it. And the next day at breakfast, they, they made us this toast with some cherry flavored um, evaporated condensed milk on. It wasn't that great, but they tried. <laughs> so it was so cute. Um, when we were doing coconut, we told everybody we were working on coconut. So we had a driver and um, taking us around. We were back in some rural area and we said what we were doing. He said, I'm going to take you to my mother's house. And we, he didn't even call her. We go to his mother's house and she made us some ice cream with um, a coconut syrup on it. And she showed us our, you know, so it's just been wonderful connecting with people. Um, I think one of the questions you had asked was how we did the research. Of course, you know, a little bit of internet, like you can look up on the internet, the record for cherry pit spitting and it's 93 feet. Um, but we went to the Michigan Cherry Festival and participated and talked to the cherry pit spitter winner. <laughs> and a picture of hers in the, is in the book and stuff. So we tried to make it very personal and connect with people. And um, so anyway, that's, I think I answered your question. Sometimes I forget what the question is. <laughs> that's great, thanks for sharing. And John, what writing endeavors are next for you? I think I'll hand the mic to you to unmute. <laughs> you all know what a swan song is? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, both Guy and I, have, my co-author and I have published a lot of, as I said, research. Uh, primary research articles um, and did this, but I think both of us have, uh, have survived and felt accomplished in doing what we did, but it doesn't lead to something else uh, at my stage in my career, really, quite honestly. So it is, it is a swan song. Um, <clears throat> if I were to write something and have the energy, uh, I have a graduate, former graduate student who is living uh, in the Amazonian uh, jungle, uh, raising a family there with a, a native woman. And if I were to go back uh, and uh, he could, we could collaborate on some of our research and, and make it more in the ethno biology, the, the, the knowledge that the native peoples in Amazonia have of, of the natural world uh, rivals uh, science in many ways. And to be able to write that up with David would be a dream, but uh, it would be quite a different book than the one that uh, we just finished. Thanks for sharing. And Rafaela, what's, may I ask the name of your Instagram page because I wanna follow as soon as we finish. Sure. Uh, it's just Ohio Tropics, one word. Beautiful. Yeah. And what's next for you? What do you foresee? So, um, Right now I'm excited because I'm getting a greenhouse um, at home. So I'm super, super excited. It's been a lifelong dream of mine. Uh, so that might take me to, you know, other writing adventures as well with, with the greenhouse. Um, and as far as I, I would love to come out with, with more books and, you know, I, this is my first traditionally published book, Houseplant Warrior. And the, I, I can't really give many details. However, I, I was already contacted lately um, to potentially write another book, <laughs> so already, and I, I which is exciting. Um, so I don't, I don't know where that's going to lead to next. Nothing's official yet, but um, I, I think it'd be it'd be really fun to maybe dedicate certain just plant maybe genus specific books on on just one specific genus of plants, um, or on on the other hand, just a wider array of of plants, almost like an encyclopedia, if you will. Um, so, so the two ends of the spectrum and then maybe the greenhouse um, issue will also give me some, some good material to write about too. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going with the flow and seeing how, how it naturally evolves. Very exciting. Best wishes on that greenhouse. That's a dream of yeah. mine someday. Yeah. Well, as we come to a close in this journey together, I wanna thank our guests for joining us for the wonders of the natural world. And heartfelt thanks to our panelists, John, Mary, 
Raffaele and Amy, just a fascinating experience today. And thanks so much for joining us, contributing to the Ohio Anna Book Festival. Um, just a friendly reminder that copies of these books uh, by each of our authors are available from the Book Loft of German Village in person and online at bookloft.com. Thanks again to our festival sponsors and partners, and thank you all for joining us. Please check the Ohio Anna website for all, this, all of this year's festival programming, and thanks again to our wonderful authors joining us today. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.